Welcome to the Detroit Church of Christ Woo! Sunday worship service. Woo! We'd like to welcome our family and our friends to our Resurrection Sunday worship service. Amen. We are going to sing Let It Rise because today represents the most important point of our faith, yep. the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. So we want to welcome you to that and invite you to sing from that gratitude. All right? Amen. Amen. Let's go. Church of Christ, good to see you guys today, and happy Easter. Happy Easter. So, Jesus is risen, and uh, you know I want to I want to share. We had a, a great morning this morning with the uh, the Easter egg hunt for the kitties, and uh, it was they, they had a good time. It looked like they were having a blast. There was uh, eggs all over the field out back, prizes, and uh, you know little goodie bags and crafts. Yeah, it looked like a great time. Uh, you know, this is I'm Andrew. This is my wife Karen, and uh, we just want to welcome you guys this morning. And uh, she's got a scripture to share. Hello, good morning, happy Easter. So the scripture I want to share is Hebrews 10, verse 23. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. You know, we, uh, we are called to hope. And, and unlike the Easter eggs this morning, you know, the hope is not empty. You know, Jesus, Jesus died for us, but he didn't stay that way, guys. You know, we have so much to hope for, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Just like Jesus, 
raised from the dead, we also have that opportunity if we stay with him. You know, I just want to uh, encourage you with that thought and that hope this morning. Uh, let us pray. God, thank you so much uh, for the hope that you give us, the hope that we have as your people. God, the hope that we can have that this isn't the end, that what we see isn't it, that there's so much more that you have in store for us, God, so many great things that you have in store for us. And, and to give us a little glimpse of that hope, you, you sent your son here to die for our sins, and he raised from the dead just to show us that this is all true and that you have hope in store for us, God. Uh, we love you. We're grateful for this. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great service. Amen. Amen. Please stand. You can't have an Easter service without Christ is risen today. Psalm 4, 452. sing every day. Oh, happy day. He taught me, he how. Taught me how. 
We're going to continue to worship God and sing, what a beautiful name. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What a beautiful name it is.
could not hold you. The veil turned before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. The heavens, the heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are Church, please be seated. The next song that we'll sing is Lamb of God.
Buenos días, iglesia. ¿Cómo están? I know that many of you have been praying to have an Hispanic ministry here, and, and I'm very glad that uh, we are growing. And before, before sharing the message today, I want you to, uh, if you help me, please, if it is in your physical capabilities, please stand up. It will be just a few seconds. You will see in the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to be ready because Hispanic ministry is going to just increase in numbers. So we need to be ready to, to receive the, the, the Hispanic disciples here and start like sharing our faith with them. So today I, I'm going to show you just two phrases, two Hispanic phrases. The first one is very easy. How you say good morning in Spanish? Re please repeat after me. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. That's perfect. It's your natural, guys. And the second one, God loves you. Please repeat after me. Dios, Dios te, te ama. ama. Dios, te ama. Dios te ama. Great, excellent. Now, if you have a person on your right, please turn to your right and say to that person, Dios te ama. <laughs> you are all turning right, so they, they, you know. You, you get the idea. That's great. Thank you very much, church. Thank you, thank you very much. We need to feel ready for the blessings. Now I want to share you a scripture in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, talks about the great fellowship of the believers at the, at the beginning of the church. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with the awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. You know, when I hear these scriptures, I'm always amazed of what a great fellowship they had at those times, you know? It's just like you get the feeling that they just build really strong and really deep friendships right there. And maybe if you are like me, you can see these scriptures in two different perspectives. One kind of people might say something like, wow, that's encouraging. You know? Today, I'm going to talk a little bit with Pete. I don't know Pete very good, but he, he looks like a really nice guy. So let, let's try a coffee. And you know what? Maybe on, 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 on Monday, I can just go with Kevin Quist, and we can have, like, coffee and donuts for sure. And maybe now that I am with the Kevins, maybe I just can visit Kevin Grady. Maybe he can recommend me a very good book because he loves reading books, you know. And, but you can have this second approach, and you might be thinking something like, hmm, every day? You know, man, I have a job. <laughs> you know, I have children. You know, I have a life. I'll pass. See you next Sunday. And to be honest, I, 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 in the past, I usually be like this kind of second type of disciple because in, in Mexico, the service always started like at 10 a.m. And I usually arrive like 10, 15, 10, 20. My wife was always angry at me because she, she always liked to be on, on time on her appointments. You know this saying that says, happy wife, happy life? <laughs> I, I was just not doing it right. And, but something changed. I mean, I, I, was very, I was a very introvert person. Uh, it was difficult for me to build relationships in the church. And I know that maybe Benjamin Dunn might be saying, that, wow, the introvert? Are you kidding me? I cannot keep you quiet for two minutes in the, in the house church. Man. But I was, and, and something changed. And I, and I had a really strong uh, situation last year when I got covid and I was part of these 10 to 15% of people that when they get sick of COVID, it gets really, really hard. It hard, sorry. And it almost killed me. It was the most difficult situation that I have ever experienced in my life. And I can tell you that also in the name of my family. It was really hard. And I remember that, you know, when you get this sick, you, you get pneumonia and your lungs are really, really bad. So you are just laying face down into your bed like 20, 22, 23 hours a day. You just can't be sit to, to eat something, but that's pretty much all. So all, the, all that, the only thing that you can do right there is just to think and pray. And I remember that I was just praying, God, 
Thank you very much for everything that you have given to me. Thank you for my family, for my lovely children, for my lovely wife. Thank you for the opportunity of this life. You know, I also want to apologize to you, my Lord, because I know that you gave me gifts. I know that you commanded me things, and I didn't follow as it should. I'm sorry. And that's why I ask you for a second chance, you know. I want to see my children grow up. I want to grow old with my wife. I want to serve you more. I want to love you more. Please give me a second chance, my Lord. And well, I'm, I'm here, church. <laughs> Thanks to God. <laughs> I'm here. He gave me this second shot. And, and something changed that day. I installed new convictions into my heart and into my mind because I knew that I wanted to do things different. And these scriptures right there were the base of that. If you read carefully, you will see that usually disciples spend most of their times in two different places. One in the temple or church and the other one at home breaking bread. So I told to my wife, it's very easy. We need to be more time in church. Maybe arrive earlier or leave, or leave late. And we need to invite disciples to have dinner to our home. And we started with a plan of trying to invite one or two disciples once a week. And at the end was something crazy because we ended up like having five different dinners at home every week. It was exhausting. But the results were amazing. We opened up our hearts to everyone, to all the disciples that were visiting to us. And it was amazing. You know, we, we get to create re these really deep and, and strong relationships with other guys, with other disciples. And... I mean, we just talk about everything, about our fears, about our strengths, about our goals, about our, uh, our blessings, about everything. You know, I remember once that there was this married couple that were sharing their testimony with us that he was kidnapped three years ago for one week. And then one of those days, he told us that he got courage enough to talk to these guys and tell them, you know, this what you're doing is just not right. I mean, if you need money, I can help you. I can give you work. You can work for me. And I won't tell the police anything. But this is just going to get you killed sooner or later, man. Please let me pray for you. And you know what they did? They prayed. When my wife and I heard his, uh, his testimony, my, my wife just looked at me and I looked at her and I knew exactly what was she thinking. What were we doing all this time? Are you telling me that while this guy was praying with people that wanted to kill him, I was just too lazy to get early to the church or just too busy to go and play video games at home instead of having a, a, these really great times with these kind of disciples. You know, I feel really blessed here in the Detroit Church of Christ because I have, I, I have received this warm welcome here with all of you. And you know, it, it's been two months since I'm here and you have no idea how much I miss my wife and my children. But spending time with you, I see that many disciples live with these scriptures in their heart, and they just like cheer me up, encourage me. Everything is great with you guys, because I see that you live these scriptures. So while you are eating the bread and drinking the wine today, I want you to think in one thing. I want you to think in the same question that my wife and I had that day. What are you doing, church? Are you having communion with God and with other disciples as it was meant to be at the time? Are you waiting for a life-changing experience to do that? I hope that this weird Mexican guy that is in front of you right now might be your, your life-changing experience. Yeah? But thank you very much, church, for everything that you have done in my life here. And I want to say you, buenos dias, Dios te ama. Let us pray. My dear Lord in heaven, thank you very much for this amazing time to be together. Thank you very much to the opportunity that you are giving us to stay together, to break the bread together and drink the wine. Thank you very much for your sacrifice, my Lord, and I ask you to open the hearts of every person here in the church. Please allow us to have these great and strong relationships that your disciples taught us. Thank you very much for your precious, for your precious blood, and in Jesus' name I pray you this, amen.
Good morning, church. Jorge, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was very impactful. I appreciate that. So this is a time in our service where we collect an offering, uh, an offering to God and to support our ministry, the ministry of sharing God's word, the ministry of advancing God's kingdom. A um, couple things I wanted to, to share, just kind of reflecting on my heart and maybe leading you to reflect on your heart, is that sometimes we can give, but our heart may be in a different spot. For example, have you ever given, but then in on back reflection, you're kind of like, man, I, I wish I wouldn't have given, or, or you're kind of like, and that hurt. So, so we're kind of give begrudgingly, right? And we don't have a good heart about it. I've been there before. Have you ever given and you do it out of duty? Like you're like, I know I should do this. I know I should give to God because he's given so much to me. And so I do it, but it's out of obligation or duty. My heart's been there before. Have you ever given out of a sense of gratitude because you know that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, and because of that, I can have lived a changed life. I can have forgiveness of sin. I can have the hope of eternal life. I can know that there's a kingdom that's going to be led by a righteous person that I can be a part of. I've been in that place too. I thought we could just look at one person who might demonstrate this. So if you'll flip over with me to uh, John 12, John chapter 12, we're just going to read verses 1 through 3. And this is, we're going to be looking at Mary. So Mary and Martha were two sisters. They actually had a brother named Lazarus. And you guys know the story, Lazarus died, right? Oh, we're just going to read, um, starting off in verse 1. Six days before the Passover, so this is right before Jesus went to the cross. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took out a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Later on, we read that this perfume was actually worth a year's wages. So what Mary had done was taken all of her work for a full year and anointed Jesus with it, poured it on Jesus right before he went to the cross. And the question I ask myself is, did she do this begrudgingly? I I don't think so. Did she do it as a sense of duty? It, It doesn't seem like it. Did she do it out of gratitude for the hope that she had? I think she did it out of gratitude. She did it out of gratitude because Jesus had just previously raised her son from the dead. Or not her son, her her brother from the dead, right? And maybe we can reflect, what has God resurrected in us? What healing has he given you? What friendships has he given you? What hope has he given you? Has he changed your life at all? And what I pray is that out of an overflow of gratitude, we can give to God because nothing else matters. Nothing. God did it all through his son, Jesus. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Mighty Father and Holy Lord, thank you so much for Jesus' sacrifice, and thank you so much for his resurrection, the hope that we have, Heavenly Father, and that's what we celebrate today, Lord. Lord, I pray that out of gratitude, we could give back to you out of an overflowing of our heart, knowing that you gave so much so that you could reach down to enemies. We were enemies of you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the hope that we have. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Greg. 
Well, hey, family, good morning. Uh, welcome to everybody that's here. Happy Easter. Welcome to everybody that's watching online. I hope you guys have your notes out. I've got a ton of really great announcements. We're going to have a really busy and amazing summer. Amen. Uh, so first and foremost, in terms of giving your contribution, you can always give at the box in the back, the black box in the back corner, or you can continue to give at DetroitChurch.org. I will say uh, quickly, Men's Midweek is going to be this Wednesday at 7 p.m. at his church next to Stevenson High School on Six Mile in Livonia, so hope to see you guys there. Also, coming up this weekend is the Spring Fling Daddy-Daughter Dance, all right? Saturday the 23rd, 4 o'clock, Novi, uh, Novi Civic Center, $7. And if it wasn't enough to get you there to see Nick Merkel dancing, my hope is may maybe Brandon Lane will be there getting down with Amara, amen? Uh, also, we've got a ton of registrations that are opening. So Midwest Teen Prom is now open. Register by April 24th, so that's this Sunday. So teens, get registered, uh, talk to your parents, whatever you got to do to make it happen, amen? Also coming up in May, the beginning of an amazing summer, we've got Family Con. You guys may have heard of Comic Con. It's got nothing on what we have planned on May 14th. And if you want to dress up, we're not going to tell you not to, but it's going to be a great time. Uh, and this is 5th through 12th grade. There's going to be a potluck, games, prizes. Make sure that you check it out on DetroitChurch.org as well. Uh, also near and dear to many hearts, the Detroit Church of Christ Summer Softball League official officially opens for registration today. You have to uh, register by May 8th to play, right? We need to get the trophy from somebody whose last name isn't Slosher, so please, I implore you to sign up. Amen. Also, with the registrations, Midwest, uh, they've got a prom, then they've got a, a camp right around the corner. Amen. Again, this is the 5th through the 12th graders. I know uh, that Corinne and Andrew are going to be there as counselors. If you need to sweeten the pot, it's always an amazing time, a great life-changing time. I can say that for sure for my kids, um, and many of you guys can probably echo the same sentiment. Amen. Uh, and then right on the heels of camp is the World Discipleship Summit in Orlando, Florida. That's going to be July 31st through August 7th. Again, an amazing time uh, to be had by all. See brothers and sisters from around the world. And then last, but absolutely certainly not least, very special, exciting announcement that there will be a baptism, right? All this, this resurrection that we're talking about, this celebration of new life, we're going to welcome Kevin Cobb Jr. into the kingdom directly after service. Amen. All right, I hope you guys got all that. If not, always check out DetroitChurch.org on our events page. Let's take a three-minute fellowship break.
seats, but stand up with us. We are going to sing another song. Amen. Let's go, church. The next song that we're going to sing is called Power. Church, please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias, Iglesia. Dios te ama. Sorry, the Spanish just comes out of me sometimes. Sometimes I forget that I'm an English speaker. You know, just Jorge. Sometimes it just just comes out of me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, want to first of all just say Happy Easter to everybody. Of course, this is a day where we. Uh, celebrate and commemorate uh, not only the most important impacting person that ever lived, but the most important and impacting event that ever was. Uh, nobody has touched more lives, that has changed, that has uh, gone through the different generations, all age groups, uh, his impact and the impact of the resurrection, of course. Uh, it goes through different cultures and different communities and different uh, uh, countries and continents. And nothing, of course, compares to the impact that Jesus had in the resurrection. Of course, people all over the world are going to be celebrating it today. And uh, hope you're inspired to, to be here. And if this is your first time, I hope it's real encouraging. Amen. Yeah. Before I get going in my service, I do actually have a special uh, guest that are here. I wanted to introduce uh, my mother and father and brother-in-law right here. This is Ruth's parents. If you guys could stand on up. Yes. 
That's right. Okay. Thank you. It's great to have you guys there visiting from Toronto, Canada. That's right. Super excited. And uh, man, I can't screw this sermon up. My father-in-law's watching. He's already mad at me for marrying his daughter. Uh, I got I to gotta make it up for in this sermon. Uh, so we are continuing our uh, series here that we started a couple weeks ago called Identity in Christ. So last week on Saturday, I had the singles in my house, and we talked about achieved identity. And that was specifically about the identity that is built through the choices that we make. And I mentioned and I talked about intentionality and commitment. You know, every car that was built, the person that built that car intended to build a car. They didn't wait, hey, let me build a house, and you ended up with a car. And in the same way as we build our identity in Christ, there are choices that we make and there's an intentionality of this is who I want to be for God. And then, of course, last week on Sunday, we talked about deceived identity and that's battling who Satan, who the world tells you you are. And one of the things that we looked at was that there are things that affect the human condition that we cannot see. And so we had achieved identity and then we have about deceived identity, and today we're going to talk about received identity, who God tells us we are. Have you ever had anybody that you really respect and admire pay you an incredible compliment? I mean, it can last, the encouragement can last for months or years. It can, it can change your life, that type of encouragement. Uh, I got a card several years ago. I was visiting one of my best friends, Chris Zillman. He leads the church in Denver. And I was visiting him, and when I got to the door, uh, you know, he was like ready to go. We were going to hang out, and his wife said, hey, hey, bro, I want to give you this card. And it was a card written by his wife, Megan, to me. And that card was just, you know, she's a very articulate woman, and she wrote in detail how over the last few years, I had impacted not only her husband, but impacted her and her entire family. And she started to you know, be very specific and detailed of things that she recalled in terms of our interactions, detailed about the impact uh, that I was having on her. And I just remember, I kept that card in my folder, and I think I read it like a hundred times. Imagine getting a card written to you from God. Imagine reading that card, giving in detail, saying to you, I see what you do, and you don't realize the impact that you're having. You don't know the lives that you're changing, and you don't know where I'm going to take you next year. You don't know what I'm going to do with your life in five, ten years. Needless to say, it would make your day, it would make your month, it would make your life. How many times do you think that in tough times you would go back to that card? The resurrection was God's card to you. It was God's card to us. It was his banner in the sky. Jesus himself said that the resurrection was a sign from God, that this is the sign that will be given to this generation. And you know, of course, if you were to ask people, hey, what's more important, words or actions? Well, of course, all of us would say actions, right? Our actions, you know, the old saying, actions speak louder than words. But here's the thing. Actions speak louder than words, but actions still need to be interpreted. Right? We know this because when you're in high school and you try to tell someone and hint somebody that you like them, they don't get the clue. And you go, actions are louder than words, but they don't, somehow didn't get the clue. Or sometimes as a, as a parent or a family member, you can be trying with your life. You can lay down your life for somebody, for your family members that you love, and you can feel like sometimes they're not getting the clue. And so we have this challenge, right, where it's, we can say words, but we often go, well, yeah, words are cheap. And we can give the actions, but sometimes we can miss the boat on those actions. Because actions, well, they need to be interpreted. There's a movie called Straight Story. It's a, it's a true story about a guy named Alvin Straight who's in his 70s. And he travels on a lawnmower. He's too old to drive. And he travels on a lawnmower over three states to be reconciled with his brother whom he hadn't talked to for over a decade. And so in the middle of the, uh, of the movie, and, uh, on his journey, and he's traveling on this lawnmower, and it takes a couple months to get there. Uh, he's someone offers, I'll, I'll just take you there. I'll just drive you there. It'll be a couple more hours. And he said, no, 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 no. I've, I've got to do it this way. And of course, the movie ends with him arriving at the doorstep of his brother, and he just, they just sit beside each other. And they don't say anything until eventually his brother says, Alvin, did, did you come all this way on that lawnmower? And he said, I did. 
And his brother's just taking it in. He's just taking it in. And he's realizing. Because actions speak louder than words. It was the story he wanted to tell his brother. You know, uh, some of you may not know this, or but uh, uh, I don't know if my, even my, my parents know this, but when I asked about 23 years ago, when I asked Ruth to be my girlfriend, I was so nervous. This is a true story. I was so nervous, I asked Ruth to be my boyfriend. <laughs> now that tells you something, right? It tells you something about Ruth. And it's like she was so awesome, so amazing, so beautiful that I got so nervous. But it also tells you a little bit about me, right? That perhaps, maybe, deep down, I'm just a nerd. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but what does, in fact, the crucifixion and the resurrection tell us about who we are. Like all actions, it takes a second to think and to interpret. And what you see in the scriptures is that, of course, in order for Jesus to be risen, he had to die first. So he had to die and be resurrected. And the scriptures talk again and again about being in Christ and that with, if you are in Christ, you are raised with him. And so the most fundamental message of this, of the resurrection, was that we are reborn. That we are reborn. And what does that mean exactly? Because, you know, it sounds pretty churchy. And, you know, if you're, uh, you know, uh, coming out here or if you're a younger person, you know, sometimes we hate churchy lingo. But let me tell you exactly what it means to be reborn. It means that we have a new motivation. We have a new perspective. We have a new destiny. And we have a new purpose. I say that again. To be reborn means that we have a new motivation. We have a new perspective. We have a new destiny. And we have a new purpose. Let's look here in uh, the scriptures. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, uh, 15, it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. It says Christ's love compels us. You know, from where I stand, it's interesting, uh, you, know, you know, when you go to church and you see what motivates people, you see the different things that compel people, that push people, that inspire. You see what moves people to come early. You see what moves people to dress up nicely. Sometimes it's who's showing up. Sometimes it's how many people are showing up. Sometimes it's the occasion. But you find out what compels people. You know, what compels all of us and what, what psychologists will tell you is that the things that are motivating you directly are a result of the things that are inside you. Not so much that are happening around you, but the things that are happening inside you. One of the things that motivates each and every one of us is, you know, kind of what we tell ourselves. And that's kind of the dialogue that Jesus is always trying to enter and he's trying to get into how you think and what you think and how you think about God and ultimately, it brings us to this idea of identity. What do you think of yourself? Consider for a second, you know, all of us, when you enter a room and you think you're the smartest person in the room, how you behave. Think of how you, when you enter a room and you consider yourself the dumbest person in the room. Right? We've all felt that at some point. Maybe you don't ask any questions. Maybe you don't say much. But, you know, all of us are influenced by the questions that we ask ourselves. And a lot of those questions, believe it or not, are questions that we ask ourselves subconsciously. You might not even know you're asking yourself this question, but it's a question you ask yourself. So here are some four of the most common questions people ask themselves, and they might not even know they're asking it. Okay? First question that you might ask yourself, and again, more sometimes consciously, often unconsciously, and that is, will I enjoy this? It's just a question you ask. It's just, it's almost by default. Whether you're going to school, or whether you're coming to church, or whether you're going to any event. Hey, there's a singles event. Hey, you want to come over to my house? Well, who's there? What's going to have there? What kind of food? Is... And then without even knowing it, or maybe intentionally, you're asking, will I enjoy this? Another question that we ask ourselves is, uh, will this hurt? Right? Is this going to hurt? Is this, hey, hey, kids, come down. And they're like, oh, is this going to involve any type of work? You know? You tell your kids, and it's, again, sometimes they ask themselves out loud, but sometimes it's a question that we ask as human beings so, so often, it's unconscious. It, it, it's just, it's just, it's buried deep within our psyche. We just, will I enjoy myself? And we ask, will this hurt? The other question we ask is, will anyone find out? 
Think of how much of our behavior is based on, will someone find out? We'll change what we do if we think, you know, hey, is it, well, and then the last question we'll ask is, what will I tell somebody if they do find out? How will I explain this behavior? What will this happen? And these are just cons- questions that just every single human being, every one of us can identify with these questions, whether it's intentional or not. But these are the things that drive a lot of our behavior. Will I enjoy it? Will it hurt? Will anyone find out? And what will I tell people if they do? And so, what does it mean that Christ's love compels us? It means that we ask a different question. And here's a question that if you follow Jesus, if you are in Christ, that we ought to ask, and it's this. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? You know, when I think about my family, when I think about my wife and kids, love required of me, I've said this before, love required of me the acquisition of character. Love required that I become more humble. Love required of me that I become more honest. Love required of me that I become hardworking, that I'm example, that I ditch my temper. Love required of me that I'm not critical of my wife. Love required of me that I was patient with my children. What does love require of you? And it's amazing how different voices can start to influence our behavior. My youngest son, Bryce, he plays volleyball. He came home just this past week and he said, you know, a 22-year-old volleyball player uh, came up to him and said, hey, Bryce, you should work out more. And he said, Dad, when I came home, I was so motivated to work out. And there's one day, of course, he worked out twice. Just, you know, there's one day, just, you know, worked out in the morning. And then later on, his older brother, Ethan and him, took him to the gym and he worked out again. And it's just amazing how these different voices can motivate us. And what the Bible is saying in our identity in Christ is now Christ's love compels us. And that we as disciples engage in this question. What does Christ's love require of me? No more just walking around and saying, man, will I enjoy this? Does this hurt? When you come to church, when you consider that relationship that is perhaps a little grindy, you ask, what does love require of me? When you consider that relationship with your spouse, or maybe there's a person here that you're just not fired up about, you ask, what does love require of me? Why? Because Christ's love compels us. Because we are reborn. And part of what that means is that our motivation is different. And the other thing that is different, of course, is uh, our perspective, it says, it continues on in that passage, Paul says, from, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. You know, Francis Bacon, you may have heard of him, was a 16th century uh, English philosopher. He uh, kind of championed the scientific method, a rational way of thinking, and he was quoted as saying uh, that all humans adopt an opinion and then they draw all things to support and agree with it. What he was talking about was confirmation bias. He was talking about we tend to have a lens and that we look through and then every single thing, and once we're committed to this opinion, everything we look at is just there to confirm our opinion. And it was in the 16th century, but it can apply today, don't you think? You look at social media, you look at the echo chambers that people live in, you look at whether it's politics or race that divide people. Man, we live in this echo chamber, and yet Paul says we don't have this type of filter anymore. It said, in fact, we even used to look at Jesus this way, but now we do so no longer. In other words, we used to have a worldly view. We used to have uh, a selfish view. We used to have uh, an academic view of Jesus, but now instead, in Christ, we look at everything through the filter that Jesus is Lord. So let me give you an example of how this works. So here you've got this uh, little train here, right? And this is the, uh, this is the you know, of course, wherever the, the control car goes in a train, everything else has to follow because they're all attached. And so wherever that train goes, and so if you have tracks that diverge, wherever that first train goes, we know the rest of that train is going to go. And so for most people, what are they led by? Their feelings. So you might walk and your, your feeling could be that you constantly give in to is selfishness. Or maybe you're just feeling lazy. So that's your feeling. What follows feelings? Well, your actions. 
your actions follow your feelings, right? Because you feel lazy, you don't do anything. Or because you feel uh, selfish, you know, you, you become a chameleon. You, do what, you become the person that whatever benefits yourself. So if it benefits you now to be quiet, then you'll be quiet. And if it benefits you, uh, you know, tomorrow to speak up so that you can get something, well, then you become who you need to be because that's how your feeling is. And so your actions follow your feelings. And then what, once you've got your feelings and your actions, and then what follows that? Well, it's your identity. And you start to identify. So, for example, again, you're feeling selfish. Your actions are motivated, right, when there's something for you. And so your identity, well, you're a chameleon. You become whatever gives you the advantage, right? What, you adopt whatever identity is advantageous for you. And, you know, you have a different type of identity, right? Or let's suppose you're lazy and you're disengaged and your identity is, well, you're confused and you're insecure all the time. And that's your identity. And then lastly, of course, once you have your feelings and you have your actions, you have your identity, well, then there's how you look at Jesus. Well, after all that, Jesus is far away, isn't he? He's so far away, or, or maybe for some of us, what Jesus, I'll call you when I need you. He's kind of the God that you go to when life's really tough because you live by your feelings. Your actions follow your feelings. You've got your identity from your actions, and now how you see Jesus is completely based on that. And so Jesus is far away. Or Jesus is just someone you go to when life is really, really bad. And Paul says that's not we used to look at Jesus through this worldly filter, but that's not how we do it anymore. And so what he says for the disciple is that first and foremost, you are led by the conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord. Your identity is, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. That this is who I am. This is following Jesus is my most important and it is identity. It is my highest calling in life. And therefore... It changes and shapes your actions, right? So your actions are, Jesus is Lord of my life. I'm a follower. Well, I'm going to be giving. I'm going to be loving. I'm going to be a man of prayer and devotion. I'm going to be encouraging. And as a result, it shapes your feelings. You're like, wow. And so you see people like that are filled uh, with in, you know, encouragement and joy, even despite severe sufferings. You know, I... Uh, Earlier this week, I uh, uh, hung out uh, with uh, our dear brother Clifton Brent, who's just sitting at the back over there. He's a deacon. He's an uh, incredible brother who's just recently uh, suffered a tremendous loss with his wife passing away. And, 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 of course, I just remember just the incredible grief, but he was so loving and giving during our time together. And I said, bro, how are you doing this? And he just said, because I know. I know. I don't think. I know my wife is with Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is Lord. And you see, so Cliff, first and foremost, and if you ask Cliff ever, what is your strongest identity? It is a disciple of Christ. And he was literally taking notes with me, saying, oh, I've got to make sure I call this brother. I've got to serve this guy. And Cuddy's like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, because his identity is in Christ, his actions, and those actions are strengthening his heart. And I think of that scripture where it says, God strengthens the hearts of those who are fully committed to him. And God blessing him. And I just thought, what an inspiring example of this model of perspective, that Jesus is not the result of so many of our feelings or our actions or uh, our identity, but Jesus is leading our life. He is the filter in which we look, right? And, you know, I, I, I have a friend. Uh, he's in the ministry uh, and then, you know, stepped out a couple times and, uh, He's a great friend. He's a very close friend, and I would say, and I, I'm confident that he would say the same about me. We're very close. But there's one thing about him is that we actually can't work well together. <laughs> we've been in the ministry and together, and we've worked, and it's just, it's just a personality thing, and we laugh about it now, right? And he uh, was in a position where, you know, he was my boss at one point, and it was a tough time for me, quite frankly. And... Uh, uh, and, but he knows. I mean, he's even said to me, like, I was a terrible boss, Mark, just so you know. And, and uh, so we're great friends. And we still are friends to this day. But he'll tell you he's not a great leader. You ever have a friend like that? Well, what's my point? Feelings are great friends, but they're terrible leaders. 
and your relationship with your feelings, if you're going to be an effective disciple in Christ, has got to be in perspective. Feelings are important. Feelings provide a range and a spice of life. But feelings are friends. But they are terrible leaders. In, uh, there you go. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's talk about a different destination. In verse 18, it says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. This is an inspiring passage. The third thing about being reborn is it means our destination, our destiny has changed. You know, in my 15-year anniversary, I had planned to take my wife out to a three-day trip to Wisconsin Dells. I surprised her about a week before, and I said, hey, we're going to take a, you know, a trip to Wisconsin Dells for three days. And she said, actually, I've been planning a trip for us to go for seven days to Cancun, Mexico. <laughs> Our destination changed. <laughs> we went to the better place. So I had, all this, I had this, you know, this, this nice little three-day trip to you know, Wisconsin in mind. Meanwhile, she had this grandiose plan to take us to Cancun, Mexico, which I was able to cancel the trip, thankfully. But Jesus Christ has an intent to change your destination. And it says in this, is it's not counting people's sins against them. You know, when you owe money to a friend, it can change the relationship. I knew if I had two friends where, uh, you know, a, a friend had borrowed, uh, a, you know, a significant amount of money, a couple thousands of dollars. And I want to say that, you know, I'll pay you back at a certain time. And then, you know, something really bad had happened in his own personal finances and things were unexpected and he wasn't able to pay back and so the friend said well no don't worry about that but what started to happen is the lender started to feel like and he, and he, and he got advice from me he said hey you know pretend his name is Bob like, it's so weird now I feel like Bob kind of avoids me <laughs> avoids my eyes maybe I'm just seeing it and at some point like when I do see Bob instead of saying hi he goes I'm gonna get that money to you <laughs> And so what he, he, he was getting advice from me, and I said, well, first of all, don't, don't lend it if you can't lose it. And he said, yeah, I know. And he said, maybe I'm just going to tell Bob, forget it. And so he just said, hey, Bob, just forget it. Like, if you want to pay back, that's on you, but you don't owe me anything. And he had to do it because the relationship, he felt like, was changing. The relationship was changing, right? And in the same way, we feel that with God. Now, I've heard it said that when, you're, when you live in anger, it's because you feel like people owe you something that when you feel like you owe other people something, you live in guilt. Well, we all owe God something. And we all not only, not only owe God for our lives, but we also have a debt to pay because of the sin that each and every one of us have. And we all got a long list of that. Sometimes we, got, we, we like to tuck that away, and maybe some of it's like 10 years ago, maybe it's 15 years ago. But we like to tuck that stuff away and not think about it. But it's there. And God doesn't want that. He doesn't want you avoiding him. He doesn't want you not looking at eyes. He doesn't want every time you come to me like, oh my God, God, I'm so sorry. Let me just explain. He doesn't want that relationship. He says, I was just wanting to say hi. I wanted to connect with you. And so he said that in Christ, he didn't count our sins against us. You know, when you, when you are taking a flight, there are markers. There are markers to tell you when you're on the right flight. Like, first of all, if you go... To Detroit, you got to take the right terminal, right? There's, there's the North Terminal and there's the McNamara Terminal. And then when you get to that terminal, you got to go, okay, which airline am I flying? Okay, I'm going Delta. And then, of course, you're with Delta. Then what do you got to do? You got to make sure it's the right gate. And these are all markers to make sure that you're going on the right flight, right? And if you're on that flight with Jesus to the destiny, let me tell you what it means for you. It means that you live in forgiveness. This is the, the one, this is the marker that Jesus has for those of us that are in Christ, that you live as somebody that forgives others because you understand how much you have been forgiven. And so you want to check, you want to check, am I, on the, am I on the right flight? Am I on the right flight? Are you somebody that just walks around with like sourpuss face all the time because you've got just an untold amount of grudges, petty grudges? You know, we were at a marriage retreat uh, three weeks ago when one of the insights about this entire marriage retreat was this idea that when you don't deal with, when you don't forgive pain, you chain yourself 
to a person and an event. You chain yourself, and what starts to happen now is that person that hurt you, you invite that person into every relationship you have. You invite them to every event that you have because you can't let go. You're chained to that. In Christ, we're free. And part of it is not just because God forgives us, but because we ourselves walk in forgiveness. Forgiveness is not the absence of pain, but the ability to love. In other words, it doesn't mean that you remembering their hurt of you doesn't hurt, but it does mean that you are, now, you are still freed up to love people. I want to make one last comment before we move into this point. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to enter into this new relationship with this person. I know some of us are battling forgiveness with somebody maybe that was abusive. And I'm not talking about trust and there needs to be wisdom and boundaries. But true forgiveness does mean that you are freed up in joy to love other people. Amen. Forgiveness is not the absence of pain, but the ability to love. And let's close off here. Last scripture. Uh, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Anytime the Bible says, therefore, you have to consider what it said before. Well, what did it say before this? Well, we just read it. It said that, uh, it said that Christ's love compels us. It said that we don't look at things from a worldly perspective. It said that Jesus is not counting our sins against us. So he says, in consideration of all those things, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. You see, God makes his appeal to the world through us, through you. And so your purpose in this world, don't tell me your purpose. In other words, show me. Don't tell me your identity. Don't tell me who you think you are. Show us who you think you are. You see, the resurrection was God telling us in more than words. And so our response needs to be in more than words. You know, in chemistry, we have a couple teachers in the audience. Uh, Brandon Lane uh, was a chemistry teacher. He's now become, where's Brandon? Where'd Brandon go? Oh, there he is. Brandon, yeah, Brandon was a chemistry teacher, and now he's... Uh, Oh, he's like, you know, he's like an intergalactic. He got all these promotions now. He can barely talk to us, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyways, he was, a, he was a chemistry teacher. And in chemistry, uh, you, uh, you have this uh, phenomenon called physical change, right? And so I have a, you know, I got a, cal- a candle here, right? And then when you light this and you heat this, this candle, you know, you, uh, of course, what's going to happen to the wax is uh, it's going to start to melt, right? And, uh, you know, I won't start a fire here, so. I turned that off. But, uh, you know, uh, same with water and ice. I mean, these things go through a physical change. But when something goes through a physical change, it is still the same substance. But then there's something called a chemical change, right? And that's like when you burn paper or when you heat up an egg, right? And uh, this is uh, an egg that my wife uh, hard boiled. And, of course, we understand, right, that once you boil an egg or you bake a cake, it's completely changed. It's not the same substance anymore. It's, and so a lot of us, a lot of times for people, Christianity is just like a self-help. It's just, a, you're, you're tinkering with it. You're just, it's just a happier version of yourself. Or it, it's just, uh, you know what, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to post some things on social media and they're just going to be really positive. I'm going to smile more today. But what God's actually asking, because, you know, it's Easter, so we've got to bring out an egg and Aldi, <laughs> is that you're completely different, that you are reborn. And how are you reborn? Because what motivates you is different. You don't just wake up and go, well, will I enjoy myself? You ask, what does Christ's love require of me today? Your perspective is different, right? Your perspective, you're not just led by your feelings. You're led by Christ. And your identity is from Jesus. Your destination is different. And we won't know until we get there, but let me tell you, if you want to have any inkling you're on the right plane, you live in forgiveness. People are going to hurt you if you're going to be a disciple. But you better be prepared to forgive and forgive and forgive just the small fraction and that Christ forgave us. Our purpose is different, right? We don't live for ourselves, but 
Therefore, because of all that, we're Christ's ambassador. God's going to make his appeal to the world through us. We're gonna, God's imploring us, other people, to be reconciled to God. In Christ, we have a completely new identity. It's not like a candle where it's just like a better, improved version of Mark King. In Christ, that old identity is gone, and we have something that is completely changed. Amen? Let's have a prayer, and then we're going to see KJ get baptized. Let's pray. Lord, we lift our hearts to you, uh, wanting to celebrate, but also to take some time in our hearts to just consider your message of love and challenge to us that is the resurrection. That through Jesus Christ and his resurrection, it tells us that each and every one of us can be changed and reborn. Help us today to be motivated by Jesus Christ. For every one of us to intentionally ask the question, what does love require of me? Help us today, Father, to remember the perspective that comes when we follow Jesus. Help us, God, today to get on the right plane, the destination of heaven, by living as men and women of forgiveness. And God, help us to, re to be reminded, to be bold about our purpose so that we can look at you and be inspired and not just know that Jesus rose from the dead, but that through Christ, we too can live a new life. In son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Can you hear me? Uh, we are now going to have uh, the baptism of Kevin Cobb Jr. Or uh, <laughs> as we know him, uh, KJ. So uh, Bryce is going to share. All right, um, so the verse KJ picked uh, is Psalm 13, 1 through 6. It reads, How long, Lord, will you forever forget me? Forget, forget me forever. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? After, and day after day, have my sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give your light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemies will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust you're in your unfailing love but my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises, for he has been good to me. Um, I remember going through the studies with KJ, and you would, always, you would always mention this scripture, and I remember reading through it and really just relating this to how like, well this depicted your, your situation in your life and your struggles at college and all these things that happened to you, KJ. And I've known you for the whole time I've been here. I remember when I first moved here, uh, you and Eric would call me rice and beans and take my shoes. And um, now, you're, you're, now you're a 19-year-old man, and you have all your convictions, and I remember just going through the studies with you, and I realized, oh, he really wants this, and oh, he really, he's really convicted, and you're doing all the challenges, and you're listening, and you're taking our advice, and you're being humble, and I'm just excited to see you become uh, my brother in Christ, man. KJ, um, I told you scripture for you, Joshua 1, 8 and 9. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Son, you have had to be strong and courageous through adversity. I don't think many people your age, 19, would have recovered like you have. My heart has been full as I have watched you grow and battle through your challenges. So I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Um, I admire you. Um, I admire your relationships. I admire you for being 19 and pursuing your relationship with God. You have impacted so many people, and I cannot wait to see what God is going to do with your life. I know you're going to do great things for God. Wow. Well, yeah, son. 
I've thought about this day since uh, you were born, 2003. I never really thought what I would say when it came. <laughs> but just looking out at this crowd, first thing I think of is I'm just grateful for this church, this family. Um, just when it says it takes a village, honestly, to raise a child, it's never been truer. Yeah. Um, I'm looking, I can have, I'm gonna make a story for everybody that see y'all here. Uh, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the family here on this stage. So I'm in organizations, but Kevin, he has a squad. He has a squad from state to state, from countries. I mean, I'm so thankful for those people in his life that help him. Like, like Bryce said, you know, you've had a journey. Some things have been good, some things haven't. But you continue on, you persevered, and you're here today. And son, um, I think you go from, like I said, my son, of course, to a man, now my brother in Christ. I couldn't be more proud of you. Uh, and I thank you for your perseverance. With that, um, of course I have a couple questions. I want to make sure I get this correct. <laughs> uh, Kevin, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, he died for your sins, and he was raised on the third day? Yes. And what is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Because of that confession, we can now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You'll be given the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You'll be added to God's kingdom, his church. Amen, church. If you could please stand. We are going to sing Who You Say I Am. time. 
Please pick up your children.